This is West Meadows, and we believe that if you show up consistently, whether on-site or online, that you will begin to see the amazing things that God can do in your life and in the lives of those all around you. to worship. In John chapter 8, Jesus proclaims, 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is a light to our lives and the lives of those all around us. He alone offers perfect love, true peace, and everlasting hope. So please join us as we sing of his goodness.
Thou art exalted far above all gods. For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted. Far above all gods, let's sing together. I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt. say we exalt God, what we're saying is that we are worshiping, we are, we are praising, we, we, we are lifting up his name. And so, so before we take a seat, as we go to a time of prayer, it's, I want to invite you to join me and just as we stand here, just to invite you to focus upon just this one characteristic of God and to just reflect upon that and lift that up as a prayer. Maybe right now you're thinking about God's holiness, about how he is perfect and pure in every way. Maybe right now you're thinking about his, his majesty, about how he reigns over the whole earth, how all things were made by his hand and, and by his power and by the, just the spoken word of his voice. 
Maybe you're speaking about his grace. You're thinking of his grace. Of how this week each of us has done things that have wandered and strayed and, and we look back and go, man, I'd do that different if I could do it again. But his grace covers that. Maybe think about his love. His honor. His mercy. As you think of these things, I invite you to, to have a seat and pray with me, Psalm 34. As we pray, O Lord, we praise your name at all times. Lord, we will constantly strive to seek and speak your praises. Lord, if we're going to boast, we're going to boast in you. Lord, those who feel helpless, may they take heart in you. Lord, may all of us come now and, and just tell and proclaim and reflect and exalt your greatness together. Lord, we pray to you and to you alone. And we know, Lord, and we pray to you because you answer us. And when you answer us, Lord, you free us from all fears that we may harbor in our hearts or that we, we, may, we may have in this world. Lord, we know and we stand firmly fixed upon the promise that those who look to you for help will experience your radiant joy. That there is no shadow of shame that will darken our faces because you, Lord, are that radiant joy that exists. Lord, those who right now find themselves in a moment of desperation, I ask, Lord, that they would bring these things to you in prayer, knowing that you, Lord, are the one who listens. And that you have saved us from all of our troubles if we would just turn our eyes and our hearts towards you. For we know, Lord, that the angel of the Lord stands guard. And he surrounds and protects and guards and encourages all those who fear you. Oh, Lord, we come and we want to taste and we want to see that you are good. The joys, but the joys that we can find when we take refuge in you. Lord, people who fear you are known as your godly people. Those who fear you are those who know that they have a need of you. And they reach out and place their trust in you. In such cases, even those who are strong as lions will sometimes go hungry. But we know that those who trust in the Lord lack no good thing. And so we come to you, Lord, as your children, knowing that you listen. We thank you for these promises, Lord that we can bring our cares and concerns before you and that you do listen, that you do respond, and we exalt you, Father, for that. Right now, Lord, we think of those things happening within our church family with the youth as they are at a retreat right now. God, I pray that this weekend was just a, an incredibly impactful time for their relationship with one another and with you. And we pray for safety as they return back to town now. Lord, we pray for Pastor Andrew and his family as they grieve the loss of a, of a loved one as Andrew's grandmother passed this week. Be with them in these days, Lord, as they, as they come together to remember this matriarch of the family, to remember the life that she lived and the impact that was left by her. Lord, we pray for those who are wrestling with relationships. May you be the hope. May you be the, the, the counselor and the guide as we navigate relationships with each other within our homes, with in our marriages. Lord, I also pray within our church as we come into a busy season. So much happening, Lord. Would you be the hope and would you be the one who reminds us that we are on the same team, that we all proclaim the same hope and the same glory of Jesus Christ and we have a cooperative spirit as we head into this busy season and that that unity that we have here as a church body would just be so impactful to the surrounding community that will be coming to us by the thousands in these next few weeks. Help us, Lord, to bring the best of you through us when we encounter them. And for all of this, Lord, we just, we'd offer it up to you as prayers, acknowledging that you are not only worthy of being the one we worship and the worthy of the one that we pray to, but that you listen, that you care, that you respond, and that you have a plan for each and every single one of us in these things. And acknowledging your goodness to us in that, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me in that time of reflection and prayer. Ah, isn't it good to praise the Lord? Amen. Amen. Well, it's just one of the ways we can experience new life with Jesus here at West Meadows. And uh, there's lots of things coming up in the weeks ahead. Opportunities for you or somebody you know who also could join in community with us to do that as well. And so just to make sure you're up to speed on all those things, we want to share with you now just a couple of ways that you could experience new life with Jesus in these coming weeks here at West Meadows. Thank <laughs> you.
This week, we want to let you know about Christmas at West Meadows. There'll be an Advent church party here at the church this Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. Families are invited to come have fun and build Advent kits to stay focused on the true meaning of Christmas. This year's Christmas banquet is on Saturday, December 3rd, and tickets are selling fast. We'll serve a professionally catered hot meal, enjoy some live background music, sing some Christmas carols, and hear a meaningful presentation. This is an adult event only and a great opportunity to invite others. To attend, seats are limited and the banquet is only two Saturdays away, so please register and purchase your tickets through the website as soon as possible. Finally, all ages are welcome and invited to come and create beautiful gingerbread houses and feast on some baked goods for gingerbread night. Invite those neighbors you've been meaning to connect with or those family friends from your children's school. You can drop in anytime between 4 and 9 p.m. on December 9th. For more details about Christmas at West Meadows, you can pick up one of these sheets on your way out. It's got all of our Christmas events coming up over the next month. You can also find more details on our website or follow us on Facebook. For anything else, you're always welcome to contact the church office. Now, let's hear this week's message. Yeah, well, good morning. Welcome to everybody who's joining us on site here and those who are joining us online as well. We're really glad that you're here today. As we come to the end of our series, the DNA of our church, uh, as we come to the end of this one, that means that next week we're going to launch into a new one, and, yep, it's Christmas, so our, our, or more appropriately, our Advent series will be starting next Sunday. Now, that may seem a little fast for some of us, because you're like, isn't it mid-November, and we're already kind of doing this whole Christmas thing? Yeah, Christmas is early this year, and so I, I mentioned that as part of a, a kind of a public service announcement, uh, but also a bit of a warning that if you do plan on attending the Christmas banquet or any of these other events that are happening, it, it's like one more Sunday, and then that weekend afterwards is the banquet. Like, there's not a lot of time, and so if that's on your mind, don't wait. You might find that more than just Christmas sneaks up on you this week. So, uh, so please encourage, uh, I want to encourage you to get your tickets and to invite people to be with you at our banquet coming up here in just less than, less than two weeks. It's like 13 days from today. So as we end this series, uh, the uh, DNA of our church, what we've been doing is we've been looking at these core principles, the, these core values that guide our activities and reveal our priorities. And I just want to start by saying thank you to everybody for your encouraging words to me throughout this series, but also for your uh, great response to our request for you to complete those spiritual gift assessments that we mentioned last week. There's still, uh, still available for you to do online. You can go to, uh, uh, if you're signed up for the weekly or if you go to the Pew Portal, you can look at the sermon notes, and there's links in those places where you can find them. The online bulletin has a link to it as well. And we want you to not just fill the assessment in, but be aware of what these core values are, because this is language that you have been hearing, but will also continue to hear throughout the days ahead. But not just hearing, we want you actually to start using this language yourselves as well. And so to help you with that, we've also created a nice little handout. Kind of like this. And you'll find these at the doors as you leave today from the sanctuary. And you'll also find some at the connection kiosk right in the middle of the foyer there if you want to grab one. And uh, on there, you're going to see that we have our, our statements, our mission and vision statements. But also, you're going to see the six core values we've been talking about through this series. Things like countercultural love. If you're with us the first week, we talked about countercultural love where we share God's never-changing love with an ever-changing world. Remember, we talked that week about the woman at the well who the world had excluded, who the world had basically devalued. But Jesus steps into her life and says, I, I see you, I know you, and I love you. A countercultural love. Then we talked the next week about heartfelt hospitality, where we cultivate a sense of belonging that softens hearts and saturates lives. Where this is not just about being welcoming and, and being friendly to people. This is, this is more about, about, about opening our circles, about making room around our tables for all people to come and feel like they can belong. Third week, we talked about encountering Jesus, where we weave Jesus into our story so others experience him through us. And we learned here that the more we know about Jesus, the more we can show about Jesus to the world around us. Week four, we talked about vibrant faith where we give God our all, trusting that we'll experience his best. And that week we talked about the, the hupitas, the, the sure foundation of the past and present experience of Christ that we can stand firmly fixed upon, that, that hupitas, the Greek word. The hupitas that leads us to the elahas, the, uh, the, the uh, action of comp 
compelling us to take steps of faith because we're so confident in who Christ is. It compels us to take these steps of faith, that is vibrant faith. And then last week, we talked about empowering people where we foster a culture where everyone's gifts contribute to serve others and to glorify God. And if you're with us last week, you remember I said that our people are our greatest resource. And so we want to acknowledge that, we want to equip you in that, and we want to empower you in that. So those are our values. You can find that sheet as you leave today. And also, if you want a refresher, if you miss any of those sermons, they're always available at westmeadows.org, or you can subscribe to the podcast on the major uh, delivers of those things. And so we find ourselves today at our final value. And our final value, we see that this is how our worshiping community, those who consider themselves to be part of West Meadows, our worshiping community intentionally goes and intentionally engages with our surrounding community for the purpose of strengthening both communities. Our worshiping community goes to our surrounding community for the purpose of strengthening both communities as we seek to do this, as we seek to enrich the lives of Lewis Farms, which is where we're located, Lewis Farms and beyond, by investing all we are to do all that we can. And when we actively bring these communities together, there's great potential for a few things to happen. First of all, there's great potential for, uh, for this kind of symbiotic relationship. If you think about it, the mere fact that we share this geographical space creates a bit of a symbiotic relationship between the church and the surrounding community. And there's great potential for as one grows for the other to grow as well. But the same is true with one weekends and the other weekends. And so we need to be concerned about how strong the community around us is. There's great potential for strengthening communities. Secondly, when we have these communities coming together, there's great potential for kingdom growth because we have the opportunity to share the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ with those that we come into encounter in the world around us. But then finally, there's also great opportunity and great potential for hesitation to kind of pull back a little bit, to say, you know what, they're different than we are. And, and so, so we hesitate in the engagement. There's also great opportunity and potential for that to take place. Because I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be teaching this too much here when I say, uh, left to our own tendencies, you've probably heard the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. Uh, don't we have this natural tendency? All of us just naturally tend to feel more, more comfortable. We, we naturally just tend to gather with people that we hold things, common affinities, common relationships with, don't we? Because we feel comfortable in those circles. When we come into a place where we know we're with like-minded people and we gather with like-minded people who share common values and beliefs and perspectives, it, yeah, it just feels warm. It just feels more comfortable. And we can share in those connections together. But then all of a sudden, when we call to step outside of that group, or if we call somebody else to come join our group, it gets a little awkward at times, doesn't it? It's okay, it's okay to agree with it. Like, like we're not... It's the reality of kind of the human condition. Because we get the sense of being awkward, like, well, like, I don't feel like I belong. And as I think about that idea of kind of one person coming into another person's group and, and feeling awkward not belonging, when I think about that in my own life, I'm, my mind goes back to when I was a teenager. And I had this friend who got invited to go to a wedding, and she really did not want to go. But she said, well, I'll go if, if I can bring somebody. And so she asked me to come as her plus one. I thought, sure, this is no big deal. I've gone to weddings before. We will go to the wedding together. We will walk in together. We'll sit together. We'll go through the service together. And then we will leave together. Not a problem. So we arrive at the service. And it turns out very quickly, it's a, it's a small wedding. Like a family only. Everybody knows everybody. And we weren't there more than 60 seconds. And I looked at her and I said, I feel really out of place here. Stay close. <laughs> so don't leave me alone. And so we sit through the service, beautiful service, and then the couple the heads out to the foyer for the receiving line, receiving line where everyone stands up and you gradually go by and you congratulate the bride and the groom on the wedding. And as we're standing in line waiting to go out, a long lost aunt pulls my friend aside and leaves me standing there completely by myself. I am alone, a stranger in a foreign land, just standing amongst this family that I don't know, just gradually, step by step, getting closer and closer to this mystery newlywed couple that I have never met in my life. And I keep looking, be like, come on back. But her aunt won't let her go, and all of a sudden, I'm next. 
I'm next to congratulate the bride and groom. And I'll never forget the feeling I had as I stood before the bride, this mystery bride I'd never met before. And I gave her a hug and I said, congratulations. And I'll also never forget her look as she looked at me and she goes, who are you? And why are you at my wedding? (laughs) And it was the most awkward situation I can think of of being out of place and feeling like I did not belong. I was a stranger in somebody else's party. Perhaps you have a story of where you felt out of place, or you felt like you were a stranger in a community that was not your own. You know, in in such moments, it's not opportunity for us to feel like, hey, I'm going to strengthen this community. I'm going to make this wedding better than it was if I wasn't here. No, our natural tendency is to flee from community in those moments, to find a place that's more comfortable for ourselves. And I'm sure we can all think of times when we felt that within ourselves, and we've been challenged with that. It's hard to step out of those comfort zones. But I want to suggest to you as well that instead of this negative perception, this negative feeling of such situations when we consider the sixth value, maybe there's another way. Maybe there's a more positive way. Maybe there's another perspective more fitting with what we're talking about with this value on how we could view those scenarios. Where instead of seeing ourselves as strangers, what if we considered ourselves to be ambassadors? What difference would that make? If you saw yourself as an ambassador instead of a stranger. See, what are ambassadors? Well, ambassadors are people who are called to serve in a foreign land amongst a people not their own. And as they're called to serve in those places and those capacities, they do so as representatives of their homeland. And what is their job? Their job is to take the very best of their homeland, to promote the purposes of their homeland amongst the people that they have been planted among. And we actually read about this sort of idea in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, where Paul says this in verse 19. He says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation, the very best of the homeland, the message of reconciliation. He's committed it to us. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We are therefore his ambassadors as though he was making the appeal through us, taking the very best of our homeland, the grace, the truth of Jesus Christ, the reconciliation with God is something we hold that we can take into a foreign land with us. And at West Meadows, when we speak about our worshiping community, the community that just stood here and exalted God, the great characteristics and attributes of God, this worshiping community, citizens of heaven, That's our homeland. Heaven is our homeland. And we are sent from our homeland as ambassadors to Lewis Farms and beyond. You know, and that was happening not just last week, but that happened almost 30 years ago when this church was first built on this plot of land. And over the last 30 years, the surrounding community of some 20,000 people have grown up all around us. And we have been given an opportunity. No, no. We have been given a responsibility to share the very best of ourselves and our homeland with those who grew up around us. See, we have a community that needs us to serve them. We have a community that needs a food bank. We have a community that needs a daycare. They need a second story store. They need benevolent support. They need counseling. They need spiritual guidance. They need to have recreational opportunities. We have a community around us that that lacks facility space where they can hold family-oriented events, where they can hold community gardens, where we can have Christmas concerts over the next three weeks where over 10,000 people will come through this building from the schools and the families around us. We have a community around us that needs to experience our most valuable resource, our people. Are people who love to welcome others. Are people who love to serve and love to accept people who come into our presence. And our, we have a community around us who needs our most important thing. Most importantly needs the good news of Jesus Christ that brings transforming power to their lives, to their homes, and to our community. Folks, we have an opportunity. Dare I say we have a responsibility. To be a place and a people that offers friendship, that offers support, that offers hope, that offers salvation. And all of these things together can offer a strengthened community. Amen? We have this responsibility as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You know what? This isn't a brand new idea at all. 
You know, if you actually look into the New Testament at some of the letters that were written to some of the New Testament churches, we find that actually they had some of the very similar situations, some of the very similar tensions between communities, and the very same responsibilities as what I've just been describing to you. One example I want to point out for you this morning is found in 1 Peter. And 1 Peter is a letter written by Peter to a number of churches who were scattered throughout Asia Minor, which is sort of modern-day Turkey. And this letter was sent to these churches to encourage them, to encourage them to stand firm amid suffering and persecution that they were experiencing in their lives. It's to stand firm and to continue to honor God with their lives as witnesses, as, as Peter calls them, as witnesses amongst these pagan communities that are around them. Now, uh, before we look any further, I, I'm not suggesting to you that living in Edmonton is some form of punishment or suffering. And don't ask your friends in Calgary about that because we know what they're going to say. But it's not. Living in Edmonton is not a form of persecution or suffering. Nor is living in Lewis Farms a form of persecution. These are wonderful people that we are surrounded by and a wonderful, very good community. The comparison I'm drawing is not to the persecution and the suffering. The comparison I'm drawing here is that we as a people of faith, a worshiping community, are placed, live in the midst of a contrary culture. And we live in the midst of this contrary culture, and therefore it is ripe with opportunity for us to create an us versus them dichotomy. It is ripe with opportunity for, for us to keep ourselves to ourselves, to just sort of cloister inside of a building and go, they do their thing, we do our thing. It's ripe with opportunity to fear, to fear rejection of other people, with opportunity to, to fear the loss of identity as a follower of Christ. And so these are the aspects of Peter's message that I think can be applied to our situation and to us today. In particular, what we see in 1 Peter in chapter 2, where he says this to the churches that are scattered throughout Asia Minor. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. We again see this idea here that he pulls out. That followers of Christ are citizens of another kingdom. Citizens of another kingdom that are brought into a different land, to a different people for a purpose, though, and with a responsibility. You know, sometimes God will do this, right? Sometimes he'll place us in situations that are not comfortable. Sometimes we'll find ourselves in a group or in a classroom or an office or, or in a public space. And, and we might you not know, use that word, uh, but we feel like the exile. We, we feel like the other to the majority who's there. Just quite often, just by the sheer fact that, that we're a follower of Christ, that, that we might be a Christian and we know that most others in the room aren't. And nobody even has to say anything necessarily or, or do anything. Sometimes if you find yourself in those situations, I know I, know I do at least, you, you just naturally feel the divide. You naturally feel the distinction, even before any word is spoken. Sometimes when I, I, I jokingly talk about this, I'll mention that this is very common for me, like when I go get a haircut. I, I used to go to a, I have a, a, just a regular barber I go to now, but I used to go to a place where every time I walked in, I would get a different barber. And sometimes it's the same one, but quite often I get a different one every time I went in. And and I, I dreaded the inevitable question. Because it's not very long you're in the chair before they go, oh, and what do you do for a living? And it wasn't that I was embarrassed to say that I'm a pastor. I just, I just hated the awkward silence that followed it. <laughs> it's like, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Hmm. Snip, 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 snip. And then usually something like, well, that's different. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, you know, why don't I just skip the awkwardness? I'll be like, what do you do for a living? I sell fire insurance for a living. That's what I do. I can sell you eternal fire insurance if you, if you need that. So <laughs> It's just easier sometimes, right? But anyways, when this awkward situation happens, I, I remember, no, wait. I'm an ambassador, and I'm on a mission. And so rather than shy away from these conversations, I wait for the awkwardness to actually surpass. It just kind of go away. And you know what I find on the other side of the awkwardness? Maybe, maybe you found this as well, if, if you've allowed the awkwardness to, surpass, to just kind of go. You know what I found on the other side of the awkwardness? I find curiosity. More often than not, I find curiosity beyond the awkwardness. 
Because the awkwardness isn't because like, oh, pastor, you're evil, bad. No, awkwardness is like, I just didn't expect that. And so we just kind of let, let it breathe for a minute. And then we turn to curiosity. And, and they'll quite ask, often ask me questions like, well, is that a full-time job? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, what, what, do, you, what do you do during your week? Do you, do you just work on Sundays? I get that a lot, believe it or not. Do you, do you just work on Sundays? No. And so sometimes the way that I explain it to people, I say this. I say, I'm like, imagine for a minute that I'm the CEO of a million-dollar organization who also has to research, write, and present a term paper every week. That's, that kind of sums up the, the personnel, the finances, the, you know, the, 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 the ministry aspects, but also the, the research, the writing, the presenting of a term paper every week. And they go, oh, okay, yeah, you'd be pretty busy then, wouldn't you? I would. <laughs> but see, here's what also happens. Is as they ask me about myself and, and this curiosity that starts to happen, they often then start, without me having to prompt them, they start to share about themselves. You know, I used to go to Sunday school with my grandma when I was little. I hear that so much. I, my grandma used to bring me to Sunday school. You know, then I got a little bit older and, you know, around the 16, 17, I, I just, I just kind of stopped going. But, you know, there was something about it that I really liked. This is so common of the stories that I hear so often from some of these people. You know, I, I went as a, as a child or I went to, I went to summer camp at the church and, but, but then I just stopped going. But there's something about it that I like. There, there's something fond about it in my memory. You know, what I increasingly find as I have these conversations with people is that they actually know nothing about church. Increasingly so. Increasingly so, they know nothing about church except one thing, what they've been told the church is against. And that is what repels them from the idea. That is what adds to the awkwardness so often. Why would I want to associate with that community based upon what I know about it? And there's two things I want to mention about that. Number one, we have, we know, we know we have a, such a more powerful, more encouraging, better story of what we're for than what we're against, don't we? We know we do. May that be what people know, not the other side of it. But secondly, I want you to know this, is that exactly that sentiment, exactly that awareness of the church is in keeping with the rising trend that happens in our society, something referred to as the rise of the nuns. Now, when I speak about the rise of the nuns, I'm not talking about women who are increasingly running off to convents to become nuns. That's, that's not the nuns I'm speaking of. What I'm talking about here is based upon national census data that has been kept over many, many decades. And if you've ever filled in one of those national census forms, you know one of the questions is to do with religious affiliation. It asks you about your religious affiliation. They'll say, do do you identify as as Christian, as Jewish, as Muslim, etc., all the way down this list. And one of the options you can tick is none. No religious affiliation. And now if you look at these stats going all the way back to the 1950s, you'll see that it was about 5% of the North American population ticked none. 5% 5% back in the 50s. And that actually held steady, 5%, 6%. It held steady up until the 90s when it jumped up to 8%. Not, not a big jump. But when you've had like, like fives and sixes for 40 years, a 3% jump makes statisticians pay attention to something. For 40 years, there's a 3% fluctuation. And in the 90s, it jumped from 5% to 8%. But then in 2008, it jumped up to 15%. And then 2012, it jumped to 24%. And in 2020, in some, dem- some demographics, it jumped as high as 30%. You had 40 years with a 3% fluctuation and people identifying themselves as no religious affiliation. 40 years, 3% fluctuation. And then all of a sudden, over the last 30 years, it has gone from 5 to 30% in some demographics. That represents a radical change in our society. And that explains why sometimes you find yourself in those circles and you're like, I just don't feel like I belong. I feel like I'm the only one. I feel like a stranger at times. This explains part of the reason why. But here's something else I want you to know. is When you ask these people, when they ask them, well, why do you have no religious affiliation? The answers kind of boil down to a common sentiment. And it's not that people are rejecting God. They're still asking spiritual questions. There is still a spiritual hunger. There is still this awareness within people, even in today's society, that there's something beyond ourselves, that there's some purpose, there's some sort of of something that's drawing us towards this idea of God. 
It still exists. But what they've rejected is this religious affiliation. They've rejected affiliating with the church community. It's like a coffee lover who says, I just can't find a good cup of joe anywhere as they drive past 20 coffee shops every day. Now here's the good news for us. The good news is that people still want to know about Jesus. They still want to know about God. And we can show and tell them about him. But it's going to look different than it did in generations past. It's how we do it, why we do it, the path towards it looks different than it did in generations past. It takes more time now. It takes more time because we have to first build relevance. Relevance that leads to trust. Trust that leads to an open door to then share the gospel. We don't live in a world where where 95% of people had an awareness and an affiliation with Christianity. You could, in that situation, you could jump right into the gospel. Let me just tell you a bit more about the affiliation you already identify with. That's not the world we live in anymore. We need to begin with relevance that leads to trust, and trust then opens the door for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And one of the best ways we can do that is by investing in the communities. Investing and strengthening the communities around us is one of the best ways we can do that because as we do that successfully, we build authentic relationships. Does that make sense? We build authentic relationships. West Meadows is one of the first buildings that was ever erected here in, West, in, in, in Lewis Farms. 20,000 people moved in over the last 30 years. Up to 30% of the community around us identifies as nuns. This is further evidence, not just by the statics, uh, stat, uh, stat, statistics that you can find online. It's also further evidence by our own experiences. Because why is it that 20,000 people would move in around us over the past 30 years and no one was looking for a church? We're the only church in Lewis Farms. Isn't that surprising? 30 years, 30, 30 years, 20,000 people, we are the only church in Lewis Farms. There is incredible spiritual apathy within the community, but there's incredible hunger and a need for the things of Christ within the community. So we may feel like strangers at times in different situations, but I say we are not strangers. I say we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors on mission from God with the valuable responsibility and opportunity to strengthen communities by investing all we are to do all that we can. And using Peter's words, the nature of of this challenge is to live as citizens of heaven in a foreign land, to use his words. Now, one of the core questions that we need to be asking, considering as we do this, is who is going to influence who in this scenario? Anytime two cultures come together, anytime two people or two groups come together, there's a chance that one's going to influence the other more than the other, right? Anytime we're made up of two or more contrib- you know, contrary views, one's going to have a gravitational pull against the other. For example, if you have ever tried to diet or lose weight in a house where no one else wants to. You ever been in that situation? What what did you make me for dinner there, dear? Well, here's your steamed broccoli and cauliflower rice with some tofu on the side. Oh, did you add anything for flavor? Yeah, sprinkle of parsley. Oh, thank you. What are you having? I'm having a salad. Caesar. Beside my garlic bread and lasagna. So, which one's going to have more pull? Right? That's not a neutral scenario. The person who's trying to be good with their cauliflower and tofu is, how long? How long? Until they're like, I wonder what lasagna tastes like. Until they kind of get pulled over this way. Th- th- these things happen. Nadine and I see it when we do marriage preparation with couples. When we talk to couples where, where one is a believer and, and one is either indifferent or not actively involved in their faith. And we warn them. There's a gravitational pull that's going to happen here. Maybe the believing partner is going to lead their their engaged, their their, uh, fiancé this direction. More often than not, though, the the, the non-believer, even if they're not adversarial, the the non-believer is going to influence the spouse this way. More often than not, that's what happens. The same risks are present when a believing community engages with the surrounding irreligious community. The same Challenge exists. The same risk is present. And that's why we have to be aware of this question of who's going to influence who and who's going to strive to look more like who. And, and Peter was concerned about this too. And the answer to the question is actually found in what he said in, in, in chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. 
And he says that he can determine who's going to influence who based upon what we do and what we don't do. And number one, he said, abstain from sinful desires. Don't eat the lasagna, is kind of what he's saying. Stay away from the lasagna. Don't give in, abstain from these sinful desires. These are the things that are contrary to the will of God. God loves lasagna, but does not mean you're trying to lose weight. Things that are contrary to the will of God, contrary to the character of God. Because as we know, there are commands and there are laws that God has decreed for his people to follow. And when you follow those, surprise, you're going to look different. You're supposed to look different. That's the point. If you follow God's laws and decrees and, and value what he values, you're going to look different. And that's part of the point. If we looked like the world, not only would it impact our influence because we're actually shifting We're shifting towards that. Not only would it look different, but it affects our definition of Christian. When somebody meets us and we say, oh, we're a Christian. Oh, you're just like me. You look just like me. You act like me. You believe like me. You must be just like me. I guess that's what a Christian is. I'm a Christian. No. A Christian example like that, a Christian who is not abstaining from sinful desires and looks like the world and yet claims the label of Christian does not have that transformed life. And all of a sudden, Christianity gets reduced down to religious practice as opposed to a transformational relationship. Does it make sense? Abstain from sinful desires as we live amongst other people. The second thing he says is live such a good life. Live good lives. Actively know and promote God. In front of others. Just live that, that life, that life of decrees and laws that makes you look different. Live it. Just live it proudly in front of other people. And when people see, when people in the world see the difference that God makes in our lives, there's something, uh, there's, there's something different about it. There's something appealing. There's something attractive about it. That doesn't mean in every situation, in every conversation, that, that living, and we know this, that living the ways of God is going to be celebrated. But when you get into these more authentic relationships, and you hold firmly fixed to your values and your beliefs in an authentic relationship, people will be curious. When you get past the awkwardness to the curiosity, you can move from curiosity to authenticity, from authenticity to transformation. Because living our lives in word and deed true to the things of God has a transformational value to it. It has the saving impact upon a people. And it opens doors for us to invite them to experience new life with Jesus as well. So as we look at this this passage, it says, you see, we're not called to stop being foreigners and exiles. That's part of the deal. We're not called to stop doing that. We are to look different by holding firmly to these things that define us. But we go to the hockey game and we cheer for the Oilers with everybody else. We just don't guzzle beer all night. We may consider to send our kids to public school, but we stay aware of what they're learning and we we want to have a voice into the community. We have non-Christian friends. Who else are we going to share our testimony with? Who else are we going to invite to experience new life with Jesus? We invite the community to come into our building to, to, for celebrations, for events, for services. We share the best of ourselves with them, our people and our resources that we've been blessed with. And we go to the community. We join the community leagues. We help the neighborhoods. We, we, we build the ice rinks. We, we serve and be known amongst the community. Now that's what Jesus was talking about when he said in, in Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, when he said that you are salt and you are are light. And he, he put it this way. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can we be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people of light, or no, no neither, sorry, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. And said so they put it on a stand. And he gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Maybe you're the kind of person that gets called salty sometimes. (laughs) Now, if somebody calls you salty when you wake up too early in the morning or because of your driving skills, that's a different kind of saltiness. (laughs) What we're talking about here is, is, is salt that adds flavor. It adds flavor. You put salt on your fries because it adds flavor, right? It makes them taste better. 
Maybe salt also we can refer to it as an, a sort of an old-fashioned saying where you're worth your weight in salt. You heard that before? You're worth your weight in salt. It's, it's because salt used to be a valuable commodity that was part of a salt trade. It had value. It, was, it was, had monetary value. But also salt has this preserving nature to it where, you know, back in, in these times there, there was no refrigerators, there's no freezers, and so you would salt things. It would help to cure and to, to allow things to be preserved. Jesus is saying here, followers of Christ, his followers add flavor to the community in a good way. Not in a mean, judgmental manner. They, they add flavor not by having a mean, judgmental spirit, but by having the fruit of the spirit. By being priests, being, being, bringing peace and, and kindness and generosity and love and joy. These are ways we can strengthen the community. Believers add value by our presence and the contributions that we make. Going back to the classic question, if we weren't here, would anybody care? If we're not adding value, we know the answer to that. We're not worth our weight in salt, if that's the case, if people wouldn't miss us. And salt, followers of Christ, also have a preserving nature because we have the good news of Jesus Christ that can eternally save people. And in Jesus, we also have the light of the world. In Jesus, we have the light of the world that calls us to let it shine before all people. Not to hide it, not to cloister and keep it to ourselves and to, in our building and our circles, but to take it as ambassadors, to bring the light with us as we go. And then Peter says this, he says, when they see your good deeds, when they see your saltiness, when they see your light, they'll glorify God. They'll glorify God. We are salt. We add value. We bring the preserving reality of the grace, truth, and love of Jesus Christ. We are light. As we can be those agents and ambassadors who can bring the light of Christ that reveals the relational, the practical, the spiritual struggles of life that people have and point them to a better way. Therefore, we can strengthen communities by investing all that we are to do all that we can. And as the worship team comes and joins me back on the platform here, I just want to encourage you to think that, you know, one day we will return to our home. We will be in our homeland. We will no longer be known as strangers. We will be known as sons and daughters who are home. But until that day, we have been given so much by God, so much that we can offer to our surrounding community. Our greatest resource is you, our people. We have an opportunity to be active in our community to meet the needs of relational needs, spiritual needs, recreational needs. We have the ability to do that. We need you to volunteer, to help us, to welcome people, to live out these values of heartfelt hospitality, of encountering Jesus. We have the opportunity to bring services that wouldn't exist if we weren't here. Benevolence support, biblical counseling, spiritual education. Even, even services like a daycare in a, in a second-hand store that is so desperately needed in these difficult times that a community is going through. We're meeting needs that exist around us. We have a building as a resource. The church is the people, but the people exist within this wonderful resource of a building. And this is the only facility within Lewis Farms that can host meetings and events and bring in school concerts. And for years, we've just so been so blessed to do that. As I mentioned a moment ago, over the next couple of weeks, over 10,000 people will come through this building from the community. We have an opportunity to host them well, to get to know them, to be demonstrations and action of God's love and grace. We have the good news of Jesus Christ as well. The greatest thing we could offer to the community. Power to change a life and a destiny as we invite people to experience new life with Jesus. And so as you walk out of here in just a few moments, as you, as you drive through the community today, you may not feel that, that close connection to every single person and every single car that you go past. Your address may not match exactly the ones that are within this postal code. You may go to a place where your culture is different, your worldview is different. They don't seem to dress and act like me. But just as God has told his followers in the past, and I believe he desires for us today, Pray for our community. Live amongst the people of our community. Befriend them. Do not become like them, but strive to help them to become like Jesus Christ. Live salty lives. Let your light shine, and let's invite them to experience new life with Jesus.
You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. And there is no one like our God. For greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Have yet to come, greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God of this city, you're the King of this people, you're the Lord of this nation. You are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the to the restless you are there is no one like our God and there is no one like our God for greater things have yet to come greater things are still to be done in this city join me in a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I I, I thank you that you've drawn us together as a community. As we talked last week, Lord, I know that there are those that you you call to be leaders amongst us and to have these special roles. But God, we believe that you called each and every single one of us here because you're creating something. You need each of us here to, to achieve something for your purposes and for your kingdom. So Lord, as a as a community of Christ here at West Meadows, God, first of all, I pray for those who are among us who are still in this curious stage of, of just investigating the realities of you. Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged today. Encouraged of the hope and the opportunity that exists with a relationship with you. And for those of us, Lord, who have, who have entered into that relationship, I, I pray that we also would be, would be challenged and encouraged as we walk through these doors that there is a world who does not know you, who does not know the joy, who does not know the... Uh, the purpose and the reason to praise and worship you. But we bring that with us. So as we go into this world this week, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have eyes that are open to see the needs. That we would have hearts that, that, that ache to meet those needs in your name. That we would have the courage. The courage to step out of the, the comfort into a bit of the unknown. Knowing that you will meet us there. And when you meet us there, you can do amazing things, greater things than we've even seen you do so far. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful ways that you used West Meadows these past few years. We thank you for the growth we've experienced here within the congregation. We, we thank you for our growth and reputation and engagement with our surrounding communities. And I pray you'll help us to continue to remain faithful to those things. We pray this all in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. If there's anybody here who would like to come forward to talk about anything or to pray, I'll be at the front for a few minutes here, and I'm glad to meet with you. Uh, after that, i got to slip out to the cafe, because if you were one of our, our newcomers the last little while, we have our kind of meet and greet with the pastor today, and I'll be back there specifically to meet with you. So I'll see you back there in a few minutes, and I hope you'll come and say hello if you are newer amongst us. We'll see you next week.